Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's an honor to be part of this conference. I've heard about it with the hearing of my ear, but uh, now my eye sees it. And uh, I'm very, very honored to be among such distinguished company. Today I want to talk about the significance of icons for the claim that human beings are made in God's image. This is not a task I undertake lightly, because especially among Westerners like myself, for whom they are not a native part of the liturgical landscape, icons can easily give rise to misunderstanding. The Reformed tradition in particular has been notoriously hostile to the use of liturgical representation of any kind as a clear violation of the Decalogue. But I don't think that's the main theological problem posed by icons today, even in the presence of the staunchly evangelical audience one expects at Wheaton. For since World War II, there has been among Western Christians in general, Catholic and Protestant, liberal and evangelical, a wide-ranging effort to mine the theological, devotional, and liturgical insights of the Orthodox tradition. This effort, prompted in part, of course, by the writings of Orthodox theologians themselves, especially figures like Vladimir Lossky, John Meyendorf, and John Zizioulis, who have sought to address Western as well as Eastern audiences in their work, has had significant impact on a number of areas of theological reflection including Trinitarian doctrine, anthropology, and eschatology. While icons have not commanded the same level of attention in Western academic theology, something of their popular appeal can be gauged from their use in the illustration of book covers, church bulletins, and Sunday school curricula. And this is where I think the problem lies, that icons, though often received with enthusiasm in the Christian West, are regarded as having a largely decorative rather than specifically theological significance. In short, they aren't viewed as prompting us to think differently about God or the world that God creates and redeems. When they are discussed in theological terms, reference is usually made to their role in depicting human beings as transfigured in glory. While this understanding of icons is entirely correct as far as it goes, it is prone to interpretation in terms of an otherworldly spirituality that does not accurately reflect the uh, dogmatic grounding of icons in orthodox theology for icons receive their theological justification as a necessary implication of the this-worldly reality of the incarnation. With this background in mind, I want to suggest that the chief significance of icons is missed if emphasis on their depiction of glorified humanity is allowed to eclipse their role in helping us to see each other here on Earth. To put it in terms of the theme of this conference, icons clarify what it means to speak of human beings as created in the image of God. The idea that icons enhance our ability to see people on Earth may seem a startling claim given the way they look. It does not take much exposure to orthodox iconography to recognize that the genre is highly stylized, with particular conventions, for example, high foreheads, large eyes, small mouths, that do not suggest realistic portraiture. And yet there are other iconographic conventions, less immediately obvious, that speak more directly to the role of icons in training our seeing. For example, the subjects of icons are never shown in profile, but always in full or three-quarter face, and still more significantly, while icons, unlike Western paintings, are never signed by the artist, all icons are named. Indeed, according to the canons of icon painting, the icon is not complete until it is named. These two ideas, that seeing a person involves looking them in the face, and, that acknowledgement that a face, and the acknowledgement that a face belongs to a particular someone, point to the anthropological significance of icons as liturgical primers for interpersonal encounters in the here and now. But before I develop this claim, it's necessary to give a little background about the development of icon veneration in the Eastern churches. The history of how icons emerged as a defining feature of Eastern Christianity is far from clear. Although the catacombs provide evidence of Christian sacred painting dating back to the second century, there is not much evidence for icons prior to the time of Constantine. During the early Byzantine period, however, they became an established part of devotion in the Eastern Church to the extent that the Quintessext Council of 692 explicitly directed that portraits of Jesus in human form should replace symbolic depictions of him as a lamb. Soon afterward, however, an iconoclastic reaction set in, initiated by the emperors Leo III, who issued decrees banning icons in 726 and 730, and by his successor, Constantine V, who intensified iconoclastic policies and gave theological depth to the iconoclast position, culminating in the decrees of the Iconoclastic Council of Hierea in 754. 
One feature of the ensuing debates that is particularly striking from a Western perspective is the relatively small role played by the Ten Commandments. Initially, defenders of icons like John of Damascus did feel the need to address the charge that icons were an idolatrous violation of the mosaic prescription of crafting images of God. John did so by drawing a distinction between worship, which was properly offered to God alone, and veneration, which referred to public expressions of respect or deference, ranging from bowing before the emperor to reverencing the altar. Icons, he argued, were objects of veneration only, and since they were not made to be worshipped, their production did not violate the prescriptions of the Decalogue. By and large, this distinction seems to have been accepted, for though the debate over icons seesawed back and forth for nearly a century after John's death until the definitive vindication of the pro-veneration iconodule position in 843, the Ten Commandments do not figure prominently in the later stages of the debate. Instead, the arguments for and against icons turned on the Christological question of whether the fact of the incarnation, of God's taking flesh in the person of Jesus, justified the production of images for liturgical use. In order to understand this latter set of arguments, I'm going to take a detour into the conceptual and terminological technicalities of Christology from which Professor Milner wisely rescinded himself yesterday. <laughs> For both sides of the debate were committed to and based their arguments on the Christological teachings of the Council of Chalcedon in 451 as further refined at the Second and Third Councils of Constantinople in 553 and 681 respectively. Crucial to all three councils was the use of the distinction between nature, on the one hand, and person, or in Greek, hypostasis, on the other, to parse the relationship between humanity and divinity in Jesus. Although this distinction had roots extending back to the fourth century Trinitarian debates, it was only in the course of the Christological controversies that racked the Christian empire in the fifth and sixth centuries that it achieved fully developed form. Whereas in earlier writings, nature tended to be understood as referring to the general category of beings to which an entity belonged, dog, and hypostasis to its concrete instantiation in time and space, lassie, by the end of the sixth century, nature was taken to refer to the whatness of a thing, the kind of entity it is, including its defining properties or qualities. By contrast, hypostasis was understood to refer to whoness or personal identity. This shift represented an important, if subtle, modification of earlier usage. Any reality can be analyzed in terms of abstract and concrete, but only certain entities, God, angels, and human beings, could be described in terms of what and who. A single plant may contain a number of separate rose blossoms, and an anthill thousands of individual members, but people are not simply a series of individual instantiations of the genus human. In other words, people are not only a series of concrete some things, but also identifiable as particular some ones. As I've already noted, this understanding of the distinction between nature and hypostasis was developed in the process of trying to speak clearly and consistently about the uniqueness of Jesus. According to the Christological definition promulgated at Chalcedon, Jesus, though just one hypostasis or person, has two natures, one divine and one human such that, quote, one and the same Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, must be acknowledged in two natures, without confusion or change, without division or separation, close quote. In other words, Jesus is a singular someone, the Son of God, but he lives out that identity through two some things or natures, such that, as God's Son, he leads at once both a fully divine and a fully human life. This basic Christological definition carried with it a number of interesting implications. For example, because Jesus of Nazareth was understood to be hypostatically identical with the Son of God, again, that's who he is, it was both possible and necessary to say things like, the Son of God suffered on the cross, and Jesus of Nazareth is the creator of the universe. Both propositions follow from the confession that the one word, who was with God in the beginning, lives simultaneously and without any qualification, both a fully human and a fully divine life. As Professor Jennings reminded us yesterday, it was the most influential iconodule theologian during the first generation of the controversy, John of Damascus, who pioneered the use of Christological arguments derived from this Chalcedonian conceptual frame to defend the production and veneration of icons. 
Though unlike his use of the worship veneration distinction I mentioned earlier, in this case, his defensive icons did not succeed in forestalling further debate. John argued that while the mosaic prescription of images made sense prior to the incarnation, the situation had changed now that God has assumed human flesh. In line with Chalcedon's insistence that the integrity of both of Christ's natures is preserved in the incarnation, since they are combined without confusion or change, John stressed that although the divine nature remains invisible even after the incarnation, because the human nature also preserves all of its distinctive properties in being assumed by the second person of the Trinity, and because the properties of that human nature include the possession of a definite shape and size, Jesus could be depicted iconographically. As John put it, quote, the nature of the flesh did not become divinity, but as the word became flesh immutably, remaining what it was, so also the flesh became the word without losing what it was, close quote. This deployment of the Chalcedonian distinction between the divine nature that remains ever beyond depiction and the divine person of the word encountered in the flesh would become crucial in later stages of the debate over icons. As John put it, quote, I do not depict the invisible divinity, but I depict God made visible in the flesh, close quote. In 754, the emperor Constantine V, an iconoclast, summoned the Council of Herea to offer formal rebuttal to John's arguments and confirm the orthodoxy of iconoclasm. It is generally accepted that Constantine was the theological as well as the political force behind this council, and ingeniously, he attacked icon veneration by drawing precisely on the distinction between person and nature that John had used to defend it. Constantine contended that the Chalcedonian definition of Christ as one person with two complete natures, joined both unconfusedly and inseparably, put the iconoduls on the horns of a dilemma. What, he asked, did the iconoduls imagine they were depicting in their persons of Jesus? Was it the divinity together with the humanity? In that case, they had clearly confused the natures, contrary to the Chalcedonian definition, since the divine nature being invisible was incapable of physical depiction. Or was it only the human nature of Christ that was painted? In that case, the natures were being divided from each other by portraying one without the other, also contradicting the teaching of Chalcedon. It followed that the production of icons was illicit, since no icon could possibly capture Christ's being as both fully divine and fully human. Faced by this powerful set of iconoclast Christological arguments, the iconoduls needed to respond in kind. And although the Second Council of Nicaea in 787 is recognized by churches in the East and West as providing definitive authorization for the production of liturgical images, it was only a generation after this council that Theodore the Studite, a monk of Constantinople responding to a resurgence of imperial iconoclasm in the ninth century offered a comprehensive theological rejoinder to the iconoclast position. Following the lead of John of Damascus, Theodore maintained that insofar as depictability was an intrinsic property of human nature, to deny that Christ could be portrayed was to deny his humanity. More significantly, against the iconoclast charge that any visual depiction of Christ could not possibly include the divine nature, Theodore argued that it was a category error to assume that either of Christ's natures, divine or human, was depicted in an icon. Natures, he noted, are conceptual abstractions, and abstractions cannot be depicted. It is part of the nature of human beings to have hair and eyes, for example, but one cannot depict hair or eyes in general, but only is given particular instantiation in an individual. He concluded that what is portrayed in an icon is not the nature of the subject, but rather the individual person or hypostasis. He wrote as follows. For how could a nature be portrayed unless it were contemplated in a hypostasis? For example, Peter is not portrayed insofar as he is animate, rational, mortal, and capable of thought and understanding. For this does not define Peter only, but also Paul and John, and all those of the same nature. But he is portrayed insofar as he adds, along with the common definition, certain particular properties, such as a long or short nose, curly hair, a good complexion, bright eyes, or whatever else characterize his particular appearance. Note the terms of Theodore's argument here. What we normally think of as the higher features of humanity, reason, consciousness, morality, will, and so forth, are not capable of depiction at all. Rather, we know a person through their material particularities, nose, hair, eyes, and the like, 
or what Theodore terms their hypostatic properties. The implications of this claim will be the subject of the balance of this paper, but I will state them briefly here. Although what we see when we look at another human being is just various bits of matter, in seeing them, we see a person, a particular who. Now, according to the Chalcedonian Christology, accepted by both sides in the iconoclastic controversy, the hypostasis of Christ, who he is, is none other than the eternal word, the second person of the Trinity. It follows that in seeing Jesus, we see God the Son, even as in shaking Jesus' hand, we shake God's hand, and so forth. In his debates with the iconoclast, Theodore argued that in the same way that Jesus' human body, like any human body, manifests his personal identity, so a picture of Jesus, like the picture of any human being, is similarly able to depict his identity. Furthermore, although an icon always depicts a particular person, Theodore insisted that an icon's ability to manifest the hypostasis of the one depicted is not dependent on the artist's skill in producing an accurate likeness. Rather, even as the diverse appearances of crosses made for devotional use, small and large, wider and narrower, with blunt or sharp ends, with or without inscriptions, none of which corresponds to the dimensions and textures of the historical wood on which Jesus was executed, does not preclude their all being recognized as the cross, so the presence of variations in iconographic depictions of Jesus does not prevent us from recognizing them all as pictures of Jesus. And Theodore concludes, the same goes for icons of Mary and the other saints. For, quote, veneration is given to the image, not insofar as it falls short of similarity, but insofar as it resembles its prototype, unquote. It is at this point that it is possible to see, I hope, how the Christological justification for the production of icons has significance for Christian understanding of human beings as created in God's image. Before we explore that question in detail, however, it's necessary to explain how the arguments for the veneration of images of Christ, who is confessed by all to be truly God, could be used to justify the veneration of the saints, who, however estimable, were in no way thought to be divine. This issue, too, was addressed by John of Damascus, who argued that veneration of the saints was justifiable in that Christ's incarnation allowed human beings to share by grace the divine status that, God, that uh, Christ possessed by nature as God's son. Though he does not put it in quite these terms, John's point is evidently that our status as specifically human persons, being whom God, beings whom God recognizes and claims as someone's to be loved, is secured by the fact that in Christ a divine person lives as a human being. Insofar as Christ as God's son is a person who claims solidarity with us by identifying his father with ours, he establishes us as persons too, someone's as well as some things. For this reason, John concludes, quote, through the images of the saints, no less than through images of Christ, I offer veneration and honor to God, for whose sake I reverence God's friends also, close quote. In short, insofar as icons are understood to depict persons rather than natures, and insofar as God, in assuming human flesh, addresses all human beings as persons called to share in the eternal communion of the divine persons, there can be no objection to making icons of saints, for the saints are just those human beings who, having answered God's call, remind us of our status as persons too, likewise summoned to communion with other persons, divine and human. Indeed, according to the principles of orthodox iconography, even depictions of Christ properly include the depiction of other human beings, since the subject of the icon can be identified as Christ in the first place only if he can be recognized as the one whose life is portrayed in the Gospels. Thus, because Christ is the son of Mary, it is appropriate, indeed necessary, for him to be shown with his mother, or as the one whose glory was revealed to Peter, James, and John on the Mount of the Transfiguration, and so on. Even as we are images of God by virtue of our relationship to the, one, to the one image who is the eternal son, so the incarnate son identity as the image of God is inseparable from his relationships to other people, relationships that are grounded in and mediated by the materiality of the body that allows both him and us to be depicted on icons. The production of icons is thus rooted in the fleshy materiality of Jesus, the same materiality that constitutes and mediates his relationship with other human beings. And because this materiality identifies Jesus as the person he is, 
even as it identifies us as the persons we are, the production of icons testifies to the belief that the human body discloses rather than obscures the person whose body it is. In other words, icons remind us that when seeing a human body, I see a person. This may not seem like an especially remarkable claim at first glance, but I would argue that it kind of cuts against some fairly well-entrenched presuppositions about the relationship between ourselves and our bodies that mark modern Western culture. In particular, it means two things. What I see, in terms of the biophysics of vision, in looking at a human being, is a body. And yet, a body is not all that I see. Let me explain. However one comes down on the mind-body problem that has stalked Western philosophy since Descartes, if not before, I think it's fair to say that we tend to decouple persons from bodies, treating the person as a reality that lies beneath or behind the garments of skin that we see, and as for this reason, ultimately separable from it. From this perspective, and notwithstanding Christian belief in bodily resurrection, we tend to view the body as a kind of barrier that we need to penetrate in order to apprehend the person within. It follows that the body does not manifest the person directly, rather the presence of a person must be somehow inferred from various bodily movements, speech, intentional action, and the like. Instead of being directly identified with the person, the body is, in short, viewed as the person's instrument. We may obsess over how our bodies look, but the very fact that we view them as objects to be sculpted, enhanced, reduced, punctured, polished, and otherwise modified in order to project a particular image of ourselves suggests that we see the body's value as more instrumental than intrinsic. And for all the significant differences between the ancient Mediterranean and our own context, something very like this view is also very much a part of the Greco-Roman intellectual world in which Christianity took root. The Platonic vision of the immortal and indestructible soul lodged, or perhaps better, trapped in a frail mortal body was a powerful influence on early Christian anthropology, even if the church consistently rejected the idea that the body was fundamentally accidental or dispensable as a feature of human being. This kind of thinking is visible even in John of Damascus' writings in defense of icons. For John, icons have primarily an auxiliary function in the life of faith. They are books for the illiterate, which provide a material bridge to the invisible, quote, holy things made by hand that lead us through matter to the immaterial God, unquote. Christologically, this understanding of icons suggests a troublesome division between Jesus' body and the eternal word, with the icon, as an image of the body, serving more like a ladder that once scaled may comfortably be left behind. Indeed, the value of icons is even more equivocal for John than this quotation suggests, for elsewhere he describes them as a mirror and a puzzle suitable to the body. Again, something we have to look behind or beyond to grasp the truth of who Christ is. In short, John casts the materiality of the icon, and by implication of the body it depicts, as something of a crutch, a deficient though serviceable means to draw the intellect to the apprehension or awareness of a higher, fundamentally immaterial reality. Understood in this way, icons are liturgical adiaphora, matters of Christian practice that are not strictly necessary, though potentially useful. Such a view of icons suggests a theology in which the material, whether identified with the body or its image, is similarly construed as a means to an end, rather than having any intrinsic theological significance. To be sure, because it is true, as I've already said, that what we see when we look at a human being, or her icon, is always matter and not the hypostasis as such, which is indeed not material, there can be no objection to speaking of icons portraying an invisible reality. What is vital is the recognition that, it's, that it is characteristic of human beings, including Jesus, that the hypostasis subsists and is revealed in the material and not above or behind it. On this point, Theodore the Studite is much clearer than his more famous predecessor, as he explicitly rejects the idea that seeing pictures of Jesus based on the biblical narrative is in any way inferior to hearing or reading the words of the Gospels. For Theodore, icons are not to be regarded as an accommodation for the illiterate, permitted in light of the incarnation, but as a necessary feature of Christian witness demanded by the confession of the words having taken flesh. Drawing an analogy comparing the relationship between Christ and his icon to that between a seal and its imprint, he reasons as follows. 
A seal is one thing and its imprint another. Nevertheless, even before the impression is made, the imprint is virtually present in the seal. There could not be an effective seal which was not impressed on some material. Therefore, Christ also, unless he appears in an artificial image, is in this respect idle and ineffective. In summary, Theodore says, Christ would lose his humanity if he were not seen and venerated through the production of an image, close quote. One may demur on the question of whether or not images are as necessary for faithful Christian confession as both Theodore and subsequent Orthodox tradition maintain, while still recognizing that this understanding of the role of icons is linked to a compelling anthropological vision. For a crucial implication of Theodore's positions is that even as God is revealed to us personally solely by the word's assumption of human flesh, so also it is impossible to encounter a human person apart from a human body. Importantly, it does not follow from this claim that a person is reducible to his or her body. Bodies change over time in ways that can and generally do include the loss or destruction of its parts, ranging from relatively benign phenomena like receding hairlines, through the gradual degradation of neurons leading to diminished mental capacity to sudden traumatic events resulting in amputation and disfigurement. And Christians have not wanted to say that human beings become any less persons through such developments. It is consistent with this position that, as already noted, Theodore insists that variations in the quality of an icon do not vitiate its ability to render a hypostasis, even as physical disfigurement does not diminish an individual's personhood. So a poorly executed icon is still an icon, a depiction of someone. The point remains, however, that there is no encounter with the person apart from the body, and it is for this reason that for Theodore, pictures are needed when, as in the case of Jesus and the saints, the body is no longer present to view. In short, if you want to meet a human person, you need to have a body. The idea that the former could be present apart from the latter fails to reckon with the basic character of human beings as embodied persons. An icon thus serves to remind us that as much as it is true that a person is never to be identified with the presence or absence of any particular bit of matter that make up her body, there is no encountering a person apart from her body. This claim takes its most startling form in Jesus, who is a divine person, the only begotten son, and thus true God. The theology of icons thus implies that to presume to know God as other than incarnate is to presume to know God other than God in fact is and thus to fail to know God at all. And because there is no knowing Jesus, the one true image of the invisible God, an abstraction from the body he assumed from Mary, we must confess that there is no knowledge of any human being as one created in that image apart from her body. And if you want to talk about the materiality of the Imago Dei, that is how I would do it. For if all the rest of us human beings are only persons, children of God and brothers and sisters of Christ, because God has come among us and called us to communion with the divine persons in Jesus, then it stands to reason that even as we are naturally embodied, we are not persons apart from our bodies. It follows that the body is not a mere container for which the person might in principle be separated. Rather, the human body manifests the human person, just as the human body of Jesus reveals the divine person of the Son. Take away the body, and the person goes with it. There is a paradox in icons. On the one hand, they are supposed to be based in historical reality, identifiable as particular people with clearly defined roles in specific historical situations, hence the insistence that icons of Jesus always locate Jesus in the context of a gospel story. On the other hand, in an icon, a saint is represented, quote, not according to the appearance of his corruptible flesh, but according to the glorified body of Christ, so lay in the Dispensky. A person is portrayed by depicting her body in a particular historical context, Jesus at the Last Supper, John the Baptist disheveled and clothed in camel's hair, Mary Magdalene with a jar of ointment. But the body is not portrayed literalistically, but as transfigured. This paradox is necessary as a means of affirming both the inseparability and the nine identity of the person and her body. Inseparability because to see a human person, as well as a divine person, requires looking at a body. There is neither seeing nor knowing a person apart from her body. At the same time, the person is not reducible to the body we see. Not only because the body changes and is subject to alteration without the integrity of the person being diminished, but also because we confess that all bodies will undergo a final definitive transformation that will disclose the person in unforeseen majesty. 
and thus providing a reminder of the sin of idolizing particular forms of bodies, white bodies, able bodies, young bodies, thin bodies, as having eternal significance. Icons thus echo the testimony of John that we are God's children, that is, persons, now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When Jesus is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Icons thus help us to see persons in two ways. First, by protesting against the materialist reduction of the person to the body, as though the body we see were simply an object for our manipulation or consumption. And second, by challenging the dualist idea that the body is a more or less accidental container for the person, as though the existence of another person out there were a matter of deduction from the motions of the body we see. The anthropology of icons is just not consistent with the idea that persons are inferred from bodies. Even Jesus' divine personhood is not something we can infer from his actions. After all, in John 14, Jesus himself teaches that his disciples will perform greater works than he does, but we would be mistaken in deducing that they are divine. Rather, his person simply confronts us in his actions, so that it is as we are addressed by Jesus that we encounter him as a person. Icons function as a sign of this confrontation, we are summoned to engage Jesus and the saints and thereby to acknowledge their and our personhood. And while it might seem that confronting painted saints will be a distraction from the community of living human beings around us, it need not be so. Rather, icons function as a summons to remember that we are confronted by other persons when we confront other bodies and that their and our reality as children of God is given in that confrontation as we seek to discern with one another the shape of the life to which we are called as persons in the body of Christ. So understood, icons are not books for the illiterate, but rather prompts for those who might otherwise be tempted to be indifferent to the community as the locus and the goal of redeemed humanity. Of course, all this begs the question of why we would be inclined to separate a person from her body in the first place given that, as a matter of fact, our knowledge of persons is inseparable from their bodily mediation. I suspect that a major reason for this temptation is our experience of death. The persons we know die, and we do not tend to identify dead bodies, corpses, as persons. Instead, we say things like, that person is no longer with us. Even though the physical body of the one who has died may look no different than it had a few minutes before when living, something significant has certainly happened. The person no longer responds to us when we speak, so that we seem no longer to be able to engage her as a person. It seems to follow that we, quite appropriately, cease to engage corpses as persons, as someones, but rather as something to be buried or burned. And yet, things are not quite that simple. Certainly, persons die. And certainly, we treat them differently when dead than alive. But we do not bury or burn human beings as we do rubbish. When dead bodies are treated that way, as in the death camps of World War II, we take as it a sign that something has gone deeply wrong. Rather, we treat them as dead persons. And if we take seriously the Christian belief that human beings are by nature embodied, then I would argue there is no basis for denying that a dead body is the person we knew that it is none other than Peter, Mary, or Fred, not just the body of Peter, Mary, or Fred lying on the slab. For the object of Christian hope for the vindication of our lives as persons before God and one another is precisely the resurrection of the body. Again, with John, we must confess that we don't know much about how that body will look, but if we know that we will be like Jesus, then we know it will mean having a body, for Jesus is risen from the dead as an embodied person. Admittedly, when we say that human beings are created in the image of God, we are not saying they look like Jesus. On the contrary, icons emphasize that all human beings who are not Jesus look different from him and from one another. As persons, they are particular, unsubstitutable individuals. To say that they are in God's image is rather to say that like Jesus, who is the visible image of the invisible God, they can be imaged. That is, that they have bodies that allow them to be depicted as persons and so encountered as persons. Again, this does not require us to look past their bodies as though their hypostatic identity were some hidden ghost in the machine, but rather at them in all their variable physical particularity. We look at something, a human body with particular characteristics, matter. 
and we see someone, Mary, or at least we should. The someone is not in any straightforward way reducible to that particular something, for we know that we shall be changed, but she is inseparable from it, for there is no human life, now or in glory, without a human body. So what does it mean to be in the image of God? The theology of icons tells us that at a very basic level, it means that we can be imaged like God. God, of course, is invisible. That is why the Israelites were prohibited from worshiping images. For you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. And yet in Jesus, God has taken a visible form as a human being, born of woman, like us in every respect. And so we know God because God has come to us in a body, and we know him in that body. In the Eucharist, we continue to commune with him through that body. And that body binds us to him. He lives and is recognizable as the one he is only as related to other bodies, both in the past and in the present. And so we know him as the person he is only as we encounter him among these other bodies, his friends, the saints, both living and dead. Icons remind us of this. But our knowledge of him and of the persons who are his friends, and thus of what it means to be made in God's image, is incomplete in the present. In their unrealism, icons remind us of this also. What that ultimate encounter will be like remains unknown to us now, but we move forward in the confidence, taking our present bodies as tokens of the bodies and thus of the persons that we shall be, that whatever the future holds, then as now, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Thank you.